When you find a situation where you need some inspiration, there's an open invitation. This could be a revelation. It's true. Well, do 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 do. Okay, everyone. So we're gonna begin with our first video here on sketch notes. And we're going to be talking about the research behind why this is a great tool to use in the classroom. So let's get started. And if this is the first virtual course you're taking from me, welcome. If it's not, I realize that I haven't been introducing myself. So let me take the time to do that now. My name is Nicole Carter. I'm one of the innovation strategists for the school district. You can find me in a couple of places. Our team has a website, bsdfutureready.com. You can also find me at mrscarterhla.com with a lot of my um, previous uh, professional development and conference handouts. And you can also find me on the Twitters at Mrs. Carter HLA if you are using the Twitter um, for professional development or to connect with colleagues. If you are not using it, don't worry about it. We will be having a virtual course coming up real soon about how to get started with Twitter as an educator and use it to your advantage. It's a great place to meet like-minded individuals. But I digress. Let's get started. I figure that the first thing we could do is uh, really get to drawing. Even though we're going to be talking about a lot of research, uh, I wanted to get our creative juices flowing. So uh, we're going to be playing a game called the Graphic Jam. I got this from Sunny Brown and the Doodle Revolution, which is one of the resources I like to tell people about if you're curious about learning more on this topic. But one of the things I hear the most from adults and from students, especially at the secondary level, is that they can't draw or at this at the time that they reach middle school something happens and they've identified themselves as being artistic and or creative or not and um, we just need to kind of let go of judgment so we're going to play a game to encourage our brains um, to think a little bit more creative and artistically and if you are participating with this virtual course with your teammates, as I hope you are, this is a course for sure that's a lot better with other people. Um, you just need to know that um, you need to let go of judgment. So I'm going to talk about it a lot. Uh, your, your drawings are going to look different than the person sitting next to you by nature of your brain. And uh, just know you, you're, most people are not going to be able to pick up a pencil and be able to draw Mona Lisa at the first go. You have to practice, and that's kind of uh, what we're going to start with right now. So I'm going to ask your brain to conjure up some images or symbols, and the more we do that, the easier it becomes. It's called building a visual vocabulary. So here is the plan. If you followed my directions before hitting play on this video, you already gathered some supplies. Uh, I need you to get six post-it notes or pieces of scratch paper, and they don't need to be full, big pieces of scratch paper. And in fact, if you just have one piece of scratch paper, that's fine. You're going to be given six words, and for each word, I want you to think about an image that you can associate with that word, and you're gonna get 10 seconds per round to doodle that word or that image. Um, just be paying attention to some of the words. Again, thinking about the fact that this is actually really not that much time. So you're not, um, you know, going to be making a masterpiece here. You are just trying to get your thoughts and ideas down on the page. So um, be thinking of that as we go and know that it might get a little uncomfortable, but that's okay. Uh, again, we're practicing. So for example, I might give you the word quality. And there's lots of different ways that you could potentially draw that. It's all about how your brain kind of registers it. So um, again, thinking about the fact that the person sitting next to you might come up with something else than you come up with, and that's totally fine and natural. And if you need to, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and pause me right now so you can get those supplies, and we'll start as soon as you get back. All right, so welcome back. And I'm, I am gonna be using my own little stopwatch to kind of time myself here. I might give you a little bit more than 10 seconds each round. That's just simply because I know that you are probably looking up at the screen to see the word as well as hearing me. So I'll keep that into account. All right, so here we go. Your very first word is necktie, necktie. And that was 10 seconds. Here's your second word, pillow. Pillow, how might you draw pillow? And that was 10 seconds. Here's your third word, voters. Voters, V-O-T-E-R-S. 
How would you draw voters? And that was 10 seconds. Here we go. Strategy. Word number four, strategy. And that was 10 seconds. Word number five, flirty. Flirty. How would you draw flirty? All right, 10 seconds, last word, ambiguous. Draw the word ambiguous. And that was 10 seconds, pencils down. So I would just ask again that you pause me in just a second and turn and talk with your colleagues. What did you notice about these words from start to finish? And um, also, how did it make you feel to kind of come up with these words? Um, just kind of turn and talk with the rest of the people in the room with you, hopefully. If not, this is a question I'll put up in the Q&A discussion thread if you feel like you, um, you know, if you were doing this in isolation, which technically I wish you weren't. But um, that should be a place where you can answer that question if you feel like you would like to ask a larger group and see what people are thinking. All right, so... As you've come back to me, um, if this is something that was kind of interesting to you and you want to test your skills a little bit more, if you've not heard of Google Quick Draw, I would like to point your direction to that. Um, if you have your computer open or if you have an iPad next to you or a phone next to you, just type into your web browser Google Quick Draw. What this is is basically um, Google's artificial intelligence gives you a word exactly like the Graphic Jam. and you have actually six seconds instead of 10 seconds to try and draw it and the artificial intelligence will try and guess what it is you're drawing. So it's a great way to continue to practice building your visual vocabulary, but it's also a good tool to, to uh, use or show to your students. Um, what is sketchnoting? Well, basically sketchnoting is a way for you to take visual notes that kind of combines handwriting and drawing get you thinking about typography to kind of show hierarchy and, you know, supporting details, that sort of thing. Um, uses shapes, visual elements like charts and graphs and arrows and icons. Um, and it's just a great way for you to connect both hemispheres of your brain um, on information that you are, context you are learning currently. So I've got a couple of pictures. I've been doing this lesson really with students from varying ages. Um, I don't go past the age of uh, or grade of three, third grade. Um, and then I've gone all the way up into some high school classes. So this is one of the very, very first lessons that I did in fourth grade over at Beaver Acres. They really wanted to use this on iPads. I, I, I've made the executive decision at this point that the first lesson I really like to do paper pencil, um, which is what you guys will be asked to do because you you walk away with a cheat sheet. But in this instance, they had iPads, they really wanted to use it and use the program. And so that's what you see these two boys doing here. Here's an example from Nicole Langton's room. She used to work over at Whitford Middle School. Uh, so this is an example of sketch notes after, I believe, reading a chapter of Roll of Thunder, Hear Me Cry. So you can see it at a uh, secondary level. Um, and this is another example for me teaching this session at a science classroom over at Meadow Park. Um, and you can definitely see a lot of different styles here. One it shows a, a student that's using a lot more um, images and color. You can see kind of down in the bottom right hand corner, a student that really was very linear and did a timeline instead. So you start to see that the way people's brains definitely um, change the, the end product for each kid, which I think is important to allowing kids to kind of make that decision of what works best for them. All right, so let's kind of dive into the brain science, because I think the more you know why this is a good thing, the more you'll devote time to it in class. Um, I just think it's a great resource for a couple of different uh, ways and we'll kind of discuss how that looks. Now when I was asked to dive into <laughs> the brain research behind, I, I've of course read a lot of, of books on the topic, seen a lot of videos on the topic, um, but I was specifically asked to look at the brain research for the multilingual department and this is what my desk looked like as I kind of dove in. These are some of my favorite books or resources. Um, 
The visual note taking for educators is one of the better ones for teachers, but um, I really love Mike Rhodes' sketchbook hand, sketch notes handbook, and then Sunny Brown's Doodle Revolution. Um, those would be some of my favorite books to point you to. But there is a huge community of people that do sketch notes online. You can definitely find a lot of YouTube videos and um, people in both Flickr and Instagram that are sharing some of the things that they're doing. It's kind of taken the educator world by storm as well. All right, so what do we know about brains? Uh, we know that they need connections um, for what they learn. And they can do that by allowing time for practice and repetition, um, but also by providing visuals. We'll talk about some of the percentages in a minute, but predominantly our brain is learning and taking in information through visual cues and images. And then also through oxygen, which obviously happens through movement. This is why brain breaks are taking over but um, also just the physical act of, of drawing versus just passively sitting and listening. It's also the physical act of like taking notes as we've all kind of seen some of the research that's come out. There is something more tactile about taking notes and the physical movement of your hand across the paper versus just typing on a keyboard. Um, so when it comes down to learning and what the brain is doing on a regular basis, first of all, your brain is receiving that input. So if a student takes in that info, they've got these pathways in their brain, they're making decisions to keep the knowledge and then process that info as they sleep, which really fascinating to me is that the students that show up in your classroom one day go home their brains make new connections their brains are literally not the same when they come into your classroom the very next day um, this part of the process is called the integrative process don't know if you need to know all of that information but I do think it's pretty fascinating and then um, the brain starts to reflect it analyzes makes more connections um, this is really where they're starting it's like it's like a filing cabinet it's trying to consolidate the info. Um, your neurons are making those tra transmitting messages to one another, making those synapse connections. Um, and it's really, really hard work at first for the brain and then becomes easier and easier the more you access those specific pathways. So the more we can have these connections start to take effect, the easier retention becomes for our students. So what we're trying to do is, again, make these pathways across both sides of our brain. So one side where we're taking in the logic and the information, and then the other side where we're trying to access creative images and symbols um, by making those pathways and asking the kids to make those connections repeatedly, then they're going to be able to retain that information more. And then finally, there's, the brain starts to manipulate the meaning. So this is where you're making connections at several points. The denser and denser of the web, um, the web connections that are happening makes it easier to retrieve that information and then process for, you know, the consciousness, like that's where we get to that meta piece where it's more likely that the content is remembered and accessed faster. So the more we're thinking about our thinking, really. And then also towards the end, if we're following through the entire process of learning, then our brain is like telling us, do something with it, apply it, take action, test it out. So this is, you know, as we talk about the importance of, you know, um, problem-based learning, the ability to actually apply what you do. I used to be a flipped classroom teacher. So the idea that my kids were taking notes at home and then actually able to apply while I was in the classroom with them to give them guidance really lends itself to this final basic form of learning. You have to be able to apply what it is you're doing. So um, this is really just the perfect way for you to explore critical thinking skills. Again, we're kind of asking for that marriage between the hemispheres of the brain. You're using strengths from different learning modalities and you're asking all of this information to just zip back, back and forth between the lobes for, for synthesis. So, I mean, uh, bottom line, it, Sketchnoting allows you to access different things. I'll kind of show you what I mean in this next slide. But because you oftentimes, when you're when you're taking in information at this as a student at the upper grade level, um, usually you've got visual information coming in. Your teacher is giving instructions, so you've got auditory information coming in. Um, those visual cues can sometimes be in the form of reading and writing, but then if we're asking to add in that sketch noting piece, that, that kinesthetic piece, whether it's just good old fashioned notes or actually adding those images, when we're adding in those images though, that's where that final emotional piece or memory piece comes in. Because usually when we're asking kids to create these images that are attached with what they're learning, they're kind of reaching back into the recesses of their memories and their prior content knowledge and they're adding that all together. So that multi-modal option becomes incredibly important. 
So um, lots of different research on this, but uh, you can see up to 50%, 55% higher ret retention. Um, Sunny Brown, in her book, she talks about this uh, doctor, name's Dr. Schofield, who uh, did some amazing work <laughs> studying sea squirts and was really revol revolutionary in AIDS research. But when she was in college, she couldn't pass organic chem. Uh, she took it the first time, failed doing traditional study, study modes, taking traditional notes. And it wasn't until she took organic, organic chem again and instituted visual notes Again, this was back in like the 70s, so visual note-taking is not new, right? So as soon as she started using this visual note-taking strategy, her retention went up, she passed organic chem, was a revolutionary in her field, and now also teaches uh, as well. She's a professor, and she asks all of her students in some capacity to try and uh, use visual note-taking to help with their retention. So I just, I think that's a great actual practical story of how people Use, have used visual note taking and it has helped them. So bottom line, it's helping with deeper learning connections. So if we only deliver information to one part of the brain, we're really neglecting all these other parts. So if we understand that many areas of the brain are taking part in reading and comprehending what we read, and then we know the reason behind that multi-sensory, multimodal learning and the fact that it's important, then the more we are to provide those learning activities, I think, in the classroom. So. Um, we need to strengthen those areas, but we need to offer the time to do that in class. And again, if we understand that learners are not just completely left-brained or completely right-brained, and we kind of force them into <laughs> some of those situations where it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but we're forcing them to exercise their brain, then uh, we can ensure that we're including activities that combine both sides of the hemisphere and activate these deeper learning um, connections. But at the same time, I think I would like to point out that this is not necessarily something that it's gonna be great for all learners. I think it's good to practice it to show that it's something that can be used because I think there's a lot of kids and I think you can think about it in your own head right now in your class that would really, really benefit from this. This is just good teaching. It's not necessarily something that's gonna be, you know, only for uh, English language learners or only for this particular subgroup of students. It's great for all students, especially when we think about the fact that we're looking at both sides of the brain. Okay. So another thing to kind of add fuel to the fire is this idea of dual coding theory. So obviously verbal is the concepts of as words, things that are coming into our brain, especially as we're learning new vocabulary, but then translating that into visual concepts like images. So I mean, both modes are active for your brain, but it's, it's creating this like associative library of words and images. So it's asking your brain to kind of cross reference between them. Um, which again, is just making those pathways more clear and having your students kind of make those connections for retention. Um, in terms of some statistics, 75% of our brain um, is actually processing through visions, vision and, and images. So when we combine um, touch vision with vision, your learning jumps by 30%. So encouraging sketch noting even for students who are able to take like great regular notes. You know, I mean, they're like I said, it's not for everybody, but when you have students that that are that love Cornell notes and that's their jam, if we can encourage that they go back and add an additional layer as they revisit their Cornell notes, they revisit the material, add an additional layer of some images, then it's gonna help them more deeply understand the content. Um, and representation between those concepts. So you're just really extracting the pass passivity of even the most well-written notes because you're actually demanding that they actively process and recall as they put these, these images together. Um, and then I know this, I know this from firsthand experience. When I'm sitting at a conference, if I'm sitting at a staff meeting, if I'm sitting at any meeting in general, if I make the decision, the conscious decision to sketch note, I have to turn everything else off and either I'm doing it on paper, pencil, or more likely I'm actually doing it on an iPad. I have to focus all of my energy into my listening comprehension skills and everything else kind of falls away. So it actually helps my concentration. I think Sunny Brown talks about this a lot that doodling has this like super negative connotation, you know, that your doodling means you're not paying attention. But in actuality, you can't really focus on much of anything else because you have to focus all of your attention on what you're listening and interpreting and then in fact drawing. So 
when your mind and body are kind of working in tandem here, there's just little room left for all of the other distractions. Also, you know, images are processed a ton faster than actual text. So, I mean, images are processed simultaneously, whereas text is processed sequentially, right, as you read it across the page. So, um, you know, as we take a look at what's happening, sorry, timer's going off. As we take a look at what's happening right now in, you know, um, our current media consum consumption, we have what's called glance media. So, I mean, this is asking whether your message can be processed effectively within like three seconds. I think YouTube actually has like an eight second rule. If you can't grab your audience in eight seconds, then they've already clicked next and are watching the next video. So when we take that all into account and we realize that, you know, we're a consumptive culture, I think asking kids to slow down a little bit, process the information that's coming into their brain and then create some sort of image is only going to help them. But we also have to keep in mind their attention span has also drastically dwindled. So I, I've used the word visual vocabulary a couple of times, um, but there's something unique about building the actual culture behind building visual vocabulary. You can't just create a culture where kids feel, say that you're going to create a culture where kids feel safe to doodle and create and draw and sketch. That doesn't just happen, right? You have to model that on a regular basis. You, as the teacher, through your posters, through uh, you know doing sketch noting live as the kids are doing it, whether you're doing it on a whiteboard or you grab a piece of butcher paper, or if you have access to a teacher iPad, you do it on a teacher iPad while the kids are doing it. Um, you know, you really should be showing and modeling doodling and sketchnoting with them. You're creating a space where, you know, your students know that they shouldn't fear making, and this comes from Sunny Brown, doodle rich messes, messes in service of, of generating ideas and mapping conversations. So really be thinking about how you plan to build that visual vocabulary in your classroom. So um, in the next video, we're going to be exploring the actual how-to. We're going to be drawing. So hopefully you've printed out the PDF sketchnote handout and you're ready to start doodling with me.